Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick and this is my channel 1984. Today I'd like to continue my uh, Super Socket 7 build. We fixed up this board in a previous video so I could uh, test out and build some CPUs for a friend and do some modding. Uh, that was going to be its own video but uh, we ran into a lot of problems and uh, yeah, it turned out to be quite uh, the challenge to get some things done and it ended up being not a video obviously but uh, part of that should be in this video anyway so this is the board we fixed we recapped it uh, did some upgrades to the bias things like that but uh, then like i said we he wanted some cpus binned so i'm gonna take the cpu out of here because it's kind of the star of the show today Put the board aside for now. So this is the CPU you're gonna use, and it might not look like any socket 7 CPU most people have seen, and it's because it's modded. Uh, there is a thread on Vogons for how to turn a K62 Plus into a K63 Plus, and that first of all involves the leading. So you would have to remove the IHS, the original one. This is a 570 megahertz K62 plus and apparently someone found a whole bunch of them and put them on eBay so there's like an auction you can buy a pack of three for $69 I think it is and the last I checked they still had over 9000 of these kits so or bundles so like 27 28000 CPU something like that still uh, so they're not rare so if anyone thinks that this K62 plus is rare it's not doesn't mean I think you should destroy it or anything like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's not hard to find nor very expensive. So what we ended up doing was uh, he bought three of them and uh, I modded two of them and he sold one. So three, that way we could get one each. But uh, anyway, let's talk about what we wanted to do and what we ended up doing. So there's a mod on Vogons. You can turn the K62 Plus into a K63 Plus and the difference between the two actually comes down to how much L2 cache is enabled. So K62 Plus has 128KB of L2 and the plus, uh, 3 Plus has 256 And to be able to mod them or enable the rest of the cache we can move a component on the chip. So I put a picture up here of uh, uh, one modded and one unmodded because uh, well, when it comes to mod like these, that might be a reason why the other half of the cache is not enabled, and it seems to be the case on both of those we tried on. Uh, the other half didn't work, so we ended up with DRAM error on postcard on our postcard. So after like 18 hours, felt like we ended up converting them back and decided we, that mod is not going to work. There are a couple of ways to do that mod. I see people report they can remove the component involved and that will also enable the cache and that didn't work either. So another mod I wanted to do and the reason we did this collab was that I wanted to put a nickel plated copper IHS on our K62 plus with liquid metal and uh, the reason for that is that my experience with both K6 ordinary K62 and uh, K62 plus, uh, K6 two plus is that uh, the colder you get them the better they overclock and the lower v-core they require so uh, the original IHS, as we can see here, is basically glued on uh, the corners here with uh, with a really weird glue. It's like silicone, uh, like you use in your bathroom, and also on the die. And it's aluminium, so it's like half the conductivity of copper, and this uh, kind of soft uh, silicone. You can can deform it quite easily so it's pretty soft so you can quite easily cut the corners and you can see here how far you have to cut not very far and there's really nothing that close to the corners that you can damage and then you can basically flip it off with something and uh, I've done that like four times and it's pretty easy pretty straightforward so yeah, and ended up skipping the L uh, level 2 cache mod because 
well, non-working CPU is kind of pointless. So I left, at the first they lived Sempron CPUs, and you can get them for like five euros on eBay or something. And see, of course, Sempron's are not particularly sought after. Being basically the seller on the equivalent of Atlon 64, like in 64 bit support and so on. So I deleted a couple of those in a vice because they're not uh, solder on. They just turn on paste, so you can just put them in a vice and pop them off. So I ended up lapping them after removing the IHS. And I ended up buying this conformal coating. It's uh, like I think there was Lewis Rossman uses and a lot of other YouTubers that do professional repairs. You can thin it out with some isopropyl alcohol too. So I ended up using this to protect anything that could be shorted out or would be eaten up by the, I think it's indium in the liquid metal, might be wrong on that one though, but it's highly like corrosive you can say. It's, uh, you, d you ideally want nickel plated copper or uh, second option would be pure copper, but you don't want uh, to use this on aluminium like this, it's gonna eat through it in no time, you're just gonna ruin it. And obviously since it's a liquid metal, it's a conductor. So I use that to protect all the ICs, so you can see an image here of my friend's K6 Plus that was already deleted by him and uh, been used in that fashion, so the corners are a little bit chipped, but uh, yeah, that's how it came to me and it's still working, so that's a K6 Plus 400. You can also see the uh, SMD component you can move, how it's installed in the full cache enabled position. And I did use that CPU to verify two boards working with K6 pluses and the model ones didn't work either. I gave DRAM error uh, postcard. So yeah. So once the, everything is protected and we have liquid metal, I basically glued it on using some uh, silicone glue. Probably not as strong as the original one, but it has worked fine. It's basically like gasket sealant. And I left a small opening around here. It's because it's based on uh, vinegar, like you use to clean away battery as it leaks. So I don't want that to corrode on the inside, so I left a small gap, similar to what AMD seems to do when they glue it on. Probably let make the gases have somewhere to get out during the curing process. So that's what I did. And yeah, so it was kind of a lot of work, and we did some recording. But uh, once the cache didn't work, and we, I think it took me eight days to bin three CPUs because they're all Prime 95 for 24 hours at uh, whatever V core they can run stable at. This one was tested 2.2 first, another one too. But I started measuring the V-core on both boards on the VRM and it's actually... His was overvolting quite a lot, almost 2.3 at 2.2 and mine was doing 2.13 volts. So I ended up setting both boards to 2.1 volts on the jumpers and that was Prime 95 stable on all CPUs. So his K63 Plus was at, was at like 660 MHz Prime 95 stable. Both K62 Plus 570s were doing 672 at like 2.2-ish volts. So they were quite equal. So in fact, I think these CPUs are more capable than the board. So I don't know where they max out, but 672 is the highest I could push my board. After that, I got uh, problems with the L2 cache, which I could disable, I got up to about 8, uh, 682. Uh, but I still couldn't use like the, the graphics card didn't want to work properly. Maybe AGP, AGP issues. So running at a very high bus of 124 instead of 112. So. Uh, the practical limit seems to be around there. I could probably run uh, 115 on his board. Uh, but his case is 3 plus didn't like to do 633. That was kind of unstable. Also, Memtest is run two passes on all CPUs. So that's why it took like eight days to do that. And like I said, I would wanted to do a video about it, but it ended up being such a pain, everything. And a bit of a disappointment. But uh, yeah, we're still quite impressed with the 672 megahertz on these CPUs. So in the end, we ended up with some real nice K62 pluses. So one is mine now. He has one, plus he has the K63 400 at 616, which actually is about 2 to 6% faster than the K62 pluses 672. So this is still a little bit slower, but uh, not bad. Obviously, if we had full cache at this speed, this would be insanely fast for a stable machine on SuperSocket 7. 
but it's still not as large by any means and I would argue that um, the board is more important. So this is our CPU we're gonna use for the upgrade of my SuperSocket 7 system. So before we move on with actually trying to build the system there is still a thing I want to do to the motherboard that I couldn't like figure out before I had the CPU but I realized uh, we got VRMs over here so this is the V core and we got the uh, I over here so we can have a look at the the heat sinks here because the, the MOSFETs uh, for the VRM has heat sinks so you can see them here and they're about 50 millimeters tall and that's so that I will clear the ISA slot uh, primarily this bottom one I think uh, but I really don't care too much about that because we got the PCI slot over here and uh, that's the best one to use for any kind of long cards are long they will either fit to the hook the clip of the cooler or go all the way past if you have the right sized very small cooler with a low profile clip so it's kind of not an issue so i would like to replace these to some taller ones and that's also a reason why this video is so late compared to what i usually try to do because it took forever to get some ones that fit delivered so let's have a look at the new heat sinks so this is a new heat sink and it's very similar it's almost not almost identical to the original one this is 66% taller about 10 millimeters so it's 25 millimeters instead we can use the IO side for comparison and you can see it's quite a bit taller not as tall as I like but uh, yeah the, this is like I said the IO side but just because it's easy to show exactly the same uh, heat sinks there the reason I want to replace them over here is because uh, with the the current, I don't know exactly how much goes through it, but uh, I think the K62 plus and 3 plus are rated somewhere around 9.5 amp at 16 to 19 watts, and that's for like a 550 megahertz K62 3 plus. Uh, this, so this is probably pu pulling like 25 watts or something, maybe a little bit more, and probably like 11 or 12 amps. So they actually get quite hot. That's not a problem for the uh, MOSFETs themselves, they're about 70 now, the hottest one, which is this one, that one is probably around 60. I think this is like 72 at the most I measured. The problem is the caps are next to it, so those get hot for no good reason. So that's why I would like to uh, replace them. But we need to uh, remove this cap over here so I can get to the screw. And then we can unscrew them here at the back to solder in. And the new one will be too. So, to remove them, a little bit of work, shouldn't be too much of a problem though. So that would be the next thing to actually do, and replace those before we put the board in a computer case. Here are our new heat sinks. You can see the original hole above. I had to drill and tap some new holes. But other than that, 
looks good to me. So you can see the stick up now over the ISA slot here. So, but that's not going to be an issue with the cards we use, so that's fine. And the CPU cooler is also always in the way, more or less. You're very limited on uh, PCI length. So, yeah, you can see original height, new height. So we're gonna do some, I'm gonna measure the temps later to figure out roughly how much we bought us on temperature. I'm gonna have a front case fan to blowing over all of this anyway. But I figured the old ones were too small to achieve the temperatures I want. So yeah. For a CPU cooler, I'm gonna use this. It's an Athlon Thunderbird cooler. So it's a Glacial Tech uh, Igloo 2320. So originally this has a 3000 RPM fan, this is 2500, uh, but the test exactly the same airflow as the original 3000, it's a newer Arctic. Uh, this plate is on the wrong way, should be the other way, but they'll fix that later. And this is just to, this is to make sure you don't short out the PCI card next to it, so that's gonna have to go here later. Uh, anyways, this is what I'm gonna use. Because the whole point of using liquid metal and everything is to cool the dye more. And uh, kind of pointless, well not pointless, but uh, kind of pointless using a crap uh, like small cooler. So this is about the biggest I can fit. Also something I didn't mention uh, with the CPU is that the IHS is 3.1mm tall now from a uh, The original one is like 1.6 I think mounted, 1.5 if you measure the IHS. Uh, and a taller thing is about two, so stock cooler won't fit, so this one is actually modified. So this is the cooler, like I said, socket A, probably works on 372 obviously. So what I had to do, when I picked this cooler, was, uh, it's, an, it's a, basically a piece of metal bent in a U-shape. So I filed this down from around three millimeters to one and a half, so that gives me that difference of one and a half, otherwise the whole cooler, if this was the CPU, it would just uh, basically sit like so. You couldn't, if you wanted to get it on, you would just break the socket, so. That's uh, one thing to keep in mind if you put uh, like a Sempron or something uh, IGS on. So yeah, and I want a new fan, so this is a brand new Sunon. I cut the Cable to length should fit. This is 3100 RPM, so it's even even higher RPM than the original one, and it's brand new. And we only have two leads because I can't measure the RPM on this motherboard anyway. In no obvious way, at least. So yeah, this is a maglev fan, so I suppose it's similar to what Nukta use on modern PC fans. Uh, comes in like five, four or five euros. This fan, I think it was like four euros. So pretty good deal, I think. And it's brand new, so it's gonna be, well not super quiet 3100, but it's definitely not gonna be noisy for the amount of air it moves. So this is gonna be nice. Uh, also bought some sleeving. Uh, it's yellow, yes. The reason was why it was on sale compared to the black or another color from the same brand. And I had a, another temp set off, so I don't remember how much I say, but it was quite a lot. I think uh, these came out at like 6 or 7 euros each with 10 meters, so... Pretty cheap, so it's slimming. So I can use, hopefully use this for like ATX and stuff or ID cables, and this is more like fans and stuff, smaller cables. So I'm gonna put that on the fan. And other things we do in the system is a plan. I also bought a whole bag of uh, 20 fan connectors. I have the opposite uh, mail too, but I bought the female this time for like four or five euros shipped them to my door. It's kinda nice. So we can have brand new connector on the fan. Uh, out of donor fans, so dead. Now I don't have the right tool for this, so this would have to do. There's obviously a special tool for this. I don't think this will be better than what I usually do, which is you reuse some old stuff. Unless I can use the whole cable and solder it to the fan, that uh, gives a good result though.
helmets are fan what are <laughs> well you can argue all you want in, in the comments if it's good looking or bad looking with yellow but that's me because I have to buy what's cheap and I can't resist the sale so yeah that will have to do everything is on a budget that I do so colors is secondary so yeah pretty beefy cooler for uh, Super Soccer 7 but yeah if you want to run uh, Fully stable at those frequencies, you're gonna get the temperatures down. When I had the old fan, this was about this space here was about six to eight degrees above ambient. So it's not like it's ice cold, it's like not warm to the touch, but it's it's actually gets a little bit warmer than one would think, even with like a 16 to 19 watt TDP CPU, uh, even with an overclock. So but that kind of lines up with what this is intended for, but because with the Natron Thunderbird. This base would be like 40C above ambient uh, at 72 watts or something like that. So it kind of lines up if you do the difference above ambient in temperature. So time to mount the CPU. So I pre-applied some uh, MX4 internal paste. I used some, uh, some uh, Kapton tape around to make a good spread. The reason why I did this, since it's the final mounting, I want the perfect amount like you can't have too much but I wanted to spread out as much as possible without getting everywhere and uh, the amount of pressure isn't as high with the, these old coolers as you know a modern cooler so I tend to actually run prime 95 off the amount of cooler that way when the pace gets warm it starts to squish out otherwise the cooler is running quite high on it that's why I did that like a fancy application this time around, since this is the final mounting is the plan. So, and here you can see how tall, tall it is, so your ordinary cooler won't work without modification. Uh, yep. And the fan header is down here for the CPU. I don't think it matters, but this board has some kind of weird fan control. So when a program probe, probes for a censorship, which it doesn't seem to have in the traditional sense, this one of the more bundled turtles and support and so on. Uh, at least that fan header over here. There's one inside here. It goes to 5 volts, which stops the fan, which is not good. So I'm going to try that one because that's actually a CPU fan. Now I don't really need to run those programs, like I think it was uh, the program I did, it was uh, Everest Home. So yeah, could be worth noting that uh, when you try out programs that looks for sensor ships and to pro temperatures, make sure the fan is actually running after you start the program or tell the program to run uh, for uh, look for sensors. I have an old install on my hard drive for testing, so I can test drive and stuff. So everything is working, Prime 95 is running, and I have measured the VRM temps, and they're about 62 centigrade, they were 72 before, so that's about a 10 degree drop. So if the caps are running 10C cooler now too, that's about double the lifespan, and those are Philips uh, low SR, pretty high, I think they're like 5-6 thousand hours at 105C, so they should last a long long time, and we're gonna have uh, in front of here is going to be in the case an 80 mm fan blowing over and with the heatsink sticking up a bit more now that should help but dropping it even more but it's, uh, it's fine now passively more acceptable you might have recalled or remember this card from one of my latest videos it's a GeForce 2 Pro 64 megabyte and I want to use this in this machine and you might think oh that's overkill and yes you're right it's very overkill the thing is, the motherboard we're going to use is from, uh, let's see here, it's from ECS. It's an MVP3 based board. And I had an almost identical one, uh, Shuttle did one, called the Hot 591P, if I recall. It doesn't go as high on the bus, it only goes to 100. This one goes to 112 officially and 124 unofficially. And the uh, Shuttle had one less PCI slot, but otherwise layout is pretty much identical. And the problem with those boards is that it's more or less impossible to fit W2. You can fit one in the PCI slot uh, uh, close to, closest to the VRM. So 
But it uh, requires uh, sm- much smaller cooler, so it's not, not an option anyway. And I would like a uh, Voodoo 2 SLI, but uh, yeah, can't have everything it seems. So what I had back in the day was, was uh, Voodoo 2 for a while, and then I got the GeForce 2 GTS. Completely overkill, but I had over the K62500 at about 600, uh, 550, 600, depending on what I was running. 600 deleted worked fine with Prime 95. So, but that was overkill, but uh, I've done some testing with this card, and it's too fast, but the GeForce 2 MX is too slow, it's about 600, uh, it's more like 7, 650, something like that, points slow in the Mark 2000, and even overclocked is still behind like 300-400 points. So, kind of want to try to mimic my old build as much as possible, so I'm actually gonna use some parts from that computer, because I still have a couple of parts from that, from 2000. So that's why we're going to use this. Uh, obviously supports TNL t- transformation and lighting, so that's going to help the CPU. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's unnecessarily fast, but it's uh, it would be a little bit of a bottleneck to have a E4 2 MX actually. The CPU is that fast, but in practice it wouldn't matter. So the same thing would be a E4 2 MX. But uh, yeah, you know, we're not going for sane here, we're going for stupid. So this fan, if you recall, is trash it's it's kaput so i have a new fan so the plan is to take the wiring harness uh, from this one and put on the new fan uh, let's see here yeah basically i don't want to be gpu bottleneck and also i want to do things i did back in the day because i didn't know better uh, and also I wanted a K62 Plus in my system, but I never found one in Sweden for sale back in 2000 when they came out and I went with, the, well maybe in 2001, but so I went with the Athlon Thunderbird 400 in 2001 instead because they were very cheap, the CPU, CPUs at the end of the life, just a couple of months before Athlon XP came out. So this is the new fan, it's a Sunon Maglev, like the 60 minute one, and uh, they were on sale, like 3 euros. So good bearing, it's still a bit high speed, like 7000, but this fan, although this heat sink is so small, it's stupid. So yeah, so I was hoping if I could steal this wiring harness from this one, well I can. Let's just see if we need to cut the cable or if we can desolder them. So. Mm. It's gonna be hard to get to. Like I said, this fan is broken anyway. There's no point fixing something costing 3 euros. And I rather, the new modern fans are so much better in quality uh, and noise level too for the same RPM. So I'd rather have a new one. Uh, could I have gone with a more expensive one at lower RPM? But yeah. So at the sooner I don't think we have to do anything special here. I think if we lift this, we should be able to see it. Yeah, there we have it. Just to hold the, so I don't burn the sticker. No one's gonna see it, but I know it's gonna be burnt if it is. So this is our old wire harness. That's our new fan.
So another thing I would like to do with this card is add some RAM heat sinks. Not because the RAM needs cooling, because there's no point overclocking it either. But because this heat sink is so small, the card gets fairly warm. I think the memory is around 50 or something. And that's one reason the card gets warm, obviously. Well, obviously, but these old ships are actually cooled to a big part by the PCB. So in the middle, the balls are connected to the ground, and that's used for cooling. So the PCB is like part of the heat sink. So, and because we have such a small heat sink on the GPU on top, a lot of the cooling is done by the actual PCB. So that means the memory got hot. So if we cool the memory, we cool the PCB, and therefore we cool the GPU. So I bought some uh, cheap heat sinks. I think it was like, uh, let me think, uh, like five euros or something for it. four of these. Was the best I could find that would fit. Something like that. So uh, I think it's like in the style of the cards of the era, the more premium cards. I got some heat sinking on them. I would argue that mostly it's kind of gimmicky, but uh, considering the temperature, temperature of these uh, due to this poor cooler here, might actually be worth having. Uh, thermal tape, we could glue them on, but I don't like that. This thermal adhesive uh, tape from Makasa is like, um, uh, says not designed for quick removal. They're semi-permanent, so basically you can remove them, but uh, they stick quite well, but they're not permanent, so that's a good thing in case you need to have a you know, replace a RAM chip or something. The heatsink are slightly uh, more narrow than the RAM, a couple of millimeters, but the yeah, closest I could find. But I've seen that on the factory cards too, so it's not like <laughs> it's not the if we were to be like factory, it's not factory incorrect either. Just a bit annoying, both factory and in this case, but it's the closest. And also I would like to have full length, but I could have ordered it for China, but I already waited like weeks upon weeks for parts on eBay and stuff. I would never get this video done at some point if I just kept ordering stuff just to get everything perfect. I think it's close to perfect, but yeah. So let's see if we can line this up here. That's our GPU we're gonna use on our graphics card. So I think that turned out pretty nicely for a budget build. This is the system we're gonna upgrade. We're gonna get to see the whole system later. I just put it on the workbench here. So we're gonna start stripping it on from the old parts. So we're gonna use, so we're not. And you can see here it's a wooded tube. You can see how long it is. So the socket would be here on the new one. So you just can't fit anything like that. This is a 110 megahertz wooded tube. The memory is the fastest one I've found for the system. And wooded tube was slower. 
with the two SLI was slower, and that's because the P side bus sucks so much on this particular motherboard and ships it. This is what they call an office motherboard in the review for it, so that's not a compliment. Uh, the CPU in here is a K62 plus 550 at 600. Uh, it hangs at 616, and I got it to post the 672 like the other one runs stable only by putting it in the window during the winter. So it's and it locked up in the BIOS after like 20 seconds once it got the slightest warm. So. And there's a lot of IO adapters on AT. To go. Some of them we don't need now since the new motherboard has PS2 for the mouse and this case does support that so I need to remove a piece of, piece of metal at the back to enable that. And that came out. That's the PS2 adapter you would use normally. And the pinout I have to change that seems to be a little bit motherboard specific. The USB adapter you can probably reuse. We have to check that the pinout is the same, but uh, yeah. And this is a VGA adapter. It's plugged because uh, you saw me taking out the uh, disc on here. It's a Matrox. I think it's is it a Millennium 1 or 2. can't remember right now. But they uh, fully upgraded. I think it's like it's a 4 or 8 makes it for him. But it's fully populated. And that's because the IGP, because it has integrated graphics, sucks. Uh, it can actually have, have its own dedicated memory on, this, on a H.2 chipset, so you can put memory on the board if the manufacturer wants to, but they didn't. So what it does is it goes out to the first RAM slots and use that. And you can technically disable it, but that actually needs physical jumper in to disable, pull it low before the BIOS starts up and it slices. And there are no jumpers on that for this, on this board, so that is a problem because this chipset is actually is a SIS 530, so it can actually do officially 130 megahertz pass, but and memory. But uh, there's a catch: you need to disable the IGP using the jumper that don't exist on this board to officially run past 110 megahertz. So that's an issue. Uh, so yeah. And this chipset also doesn't support uh, memory interleaving, which is also a big bottleneck. Just remember how annoyingly tight the system is to cut the cable. Another thing with this motherboard is it has no external cache, because once again this is a budget office board, so yeah, memory performance sucks on two fronts there. And as you can probably see now, it has no AGP. It's marked as having a 100 meters AGP, but that goes to the AGP. Completely pointless. So, let's see. Here's the network card. We're going to use that. It's an AM, ADM Tech, AM939A3B. Yeah. I ran the system, the test, uh, the test card I had was an Realtek 8139. I found this to be even faster, and this is way faster than the 3Com card of this system. This cost me about 1 frame per second in Quake 2, the Realtek cost me about 2, and uh, 3Com 905, the usual one people like, it cost me about 11. And I think I maxed out at like 55 frames per second in Quake 2 on a 600mm CPU with W2. That's not fast. And the thing is, like once you start going on 2 to 300 megahertz on the CPU, you basically I/O limited for RAM for PCI, so it's uh, it sucks. So yeah, let's get the sound card out. And pull out the I/O connection, the front panel connection there. So this sound card we're gonna use, and this is actually from my old Pentium 166 back in 2000. No, back in 1996, it's a long time ago. And I had this in my uh, K62 system. Also tried uh, some was live about that, but due to the EMU 10K bug with the PCI, it uh, didn't work well. So we're not gonna try that again ever. So just uh, creative live cards just sucks on the MVP tray shift. So let's see if we can actually remove the motherboard now. Seems like it. 
leave something weird. Cable management using the heatsink. So we would need something like this heatsink here. You can see quite clearly there's a lot of space here and it's very flat here. So on the other board with this heatsink I could fit a Wii really 2 a single one. That's what I did like back in the day. They had a very, not the same, but identical heatsink with the, an original fan. This original fans or AVC tend to die pretty quickly. So the same thing happened to this one. I think this has 256 megabytes of RAM. Uh, we're not going to use that on the new one, but we're going to use 128. Uh, the reason for that is that the new motherboard has external cache, but it has half a megabyte. For every half of a megabyte, you have a 512K. And you can get the most performance with 128 megabytes of memory. Uh, cache the memory, so to speak. Uh, yeah, so the ratio is 512K for every 128 megabytes. And it's actually a big uh, performance uh, drop if you use 256. Uh, I've lost about 650 points in 3 Mark 2000, and that, that's like 15%. Maybe even more. This system should, once we're done, probably hit over 4K, I hope, in 3 Mark 2000. I've done it once, but uh, yeah, my install is a bit foobar right now, so I can't repeat that. I have some new tweaks too, so I think we should actually be able to beat my like 4043 4, or something. Let's see. Also, this case has horrible cooling. You can see here, it's a fun fun here. Uh, let's just say you have to use a needle to fit them through the holes. Not these holes here particularly. They are a little bit bigger, but the front panel has needle sized holes. But, yeah. well, at the very bottom, it's completely shut off here. I don't know if you can see my fingers at the bottom of the frame. I can't push the computer up anymore. But uh, I figure we make a cut out there, remove the make a proper 80 millimeter hole there, then we're gonna get good airflow. Because even with this CPU, it's run perfectly cool with the case open like now, but if you actually put the cover on it, it will actually get fairly warm. And that was also a problem with the boot 2 got fairly warm, I didn't like that, because it actually affects the card negatively. Instability. You can't uh, exploit the 110 mm memory. Usually does 105 on a cool day, open case, but... Uh, yeah, I was thinking of adding heat sink and fans and stuff to that card, but since we can't use it now, it's no point. So, and we're screwed. Yeah, so this system does about 1500.3 mark with the CPU at 560. That's because it's fast to run down 12 meters plus and I can't run 6, 616. It just crashes. Crashes and locks up. So, because it's, we're bottlenecked by IO, any increase in bus directly translates to performance with this crap board. It does that on pretty much every Socket 7 board, but this is so limited, it's stupid. So, it's our board out. So this is SIS530 with IDP, no memory interleaving. As you can see, no cache to be found. So yeah. It's probably a good test for this test stuff. I mean, the CPU is fine, and the reason I have a K62 550 in it is because I did the same guy who sponsored me now, I could say, with the, the motherboard and uh, CPU, Mr. Necker Dude, on, uh, over on Brain Drainland Discord. Uh, he gave me this uh, board. He, he basically said, Take one board out of this pile and take one CPU. And the best, only 100 mesh board was this one, and the only CPU that makes sense was. The K K62 Plus with in built-in L2 cache that at least compensates for the external one somewhat. But there's still a performance hit, obviously, and then everything else sucked on the board eventually, I figured out. Uh, Asus apparently makes a good board with this chipset that can be disabled IDP and you can run 130 megabits bus and so on. But it still just equals like a hundred on the underboard I have. So even if I could run that, that board would be faster than 112. And this doesn't have an L2 cache like the Asus probably has a megabyte or something. So yeah, this is an office board according to reviews because it sucks. So it's going to be obviously kept and be used for testing probably, testing stuff. Nothing wrong with it, it's just slow. So yeah, I'm going to keep stripping this down, fix the, make sure we have a new fan in front here with some actual working airflow. And yeah, 
And we're gonna, we're gonna remove the hard drive and the power supply in the meantime. We're gonna have a new hard drive anyway. Before we start building, we're gonna look at some parts we're gonna need. If I can make that shine go away. So this is uh, my boxed uh, SCSI card, an Adaptec 19160. So I bought this I think in 2004 or 5 for a dual Optron 244 system. Uh, as a beginner kit. This is not the original cable, it's in a 486 that didn't work uh, with this one, but this one works with this card and drive. And this is the original 15 pin cable intended for mostly for uh, SCSI CD rooms, CD room drive, optical unit, and then the card, which you can see I glanced at before, oh, probably. So, yeah, this is a Ultra 160 card on a PCI bus, so the limit is the PCI bus for the card, 133 megabytes per second. So, we're gonna use this, and for a hard drive, I got this. 73 gigabyte 10,000 RPM Seagate Cheetah U1320 uh, so ultra 20 megabyte per second it's 73 gigabytes uh, it's uh, about it as a well used but not really used uh, I bought it in 2006 from Alpha from someone who bought the wrong drive I didn't say what was wrong but uh, I suspect maybe wanted 80 pin scassy so it was new in box basically so it's been running like one year from 2006 to 2007 so it's pretty mint uh, it's not new but close to it and uh, then i have this optical unit it's 50 pins gassy so uh, i bought this on ebay a few years ago this both the card and the hard drive and this unit. Well, not the hard drive, but I had some other hard drives. But they came out with a P3 system where I built my Atom MP in. So that's why we can reuse them. Uh, so if we look at the SCSI card again, you can see here 50 pin over here for optical. That's what the manual says. I do have the manual and original copy. So it's intended for optical units mostly. And this is for the hard drive. So there are two independent buses. So this can run it well up to U160. So with the U1320 drive, we're gonna be limited to 160. But like I said, the PCI bus on this 19160 card is the limiting factor. But yeah, the nice thing with this too is that it supports optical boot. So you can turn that on uh, and boot off the SCSI CD room to install stuff. So I ran Linux off it and so on. Uh, yeah. So that's what we're gonna use, and you already see the other cards, the graphics card obviously, and the network card and the sound card, which is the normal sound of 16. So a nice thing with this case we're using is that it has a removable motherboard tray. So I'm just gonna remove this PS2 mouse cover here. So one time D, so gone. So now we should be able to install a motherboard, though I haven't checked these. Uh, that should that's parallel but these two are serial there's two pinouts for these uh, i don't remember what the standards are called but inter tend to have theirs and amd other, like more common on amd what i found is another pinout so sometimes when you buy new ones they don't work with older boards like socket 7 486 and stuff so i have to open them up and resolder them i can google it like pinouts for for them there's two different ones and if you open up you're gonna see if it doesn't work and you have and then you can just try the opposite. That's a common reason why I can't get comfort to, to work. I don't use them on these machines really. 46 is more or less needed for mouse, but uh, yeah, these were working with other motherboard, but I haven't verified if this board uses the same. It usually doesn't say you get them with the board. That's why it's annoying when you mix them up between different boards. Uh, this is parallel, shouldn't be an issue. No, I think we're finally ready. Oh, that didn't work. Just realized if you use this, there's no hole for the PS2 port. Screw it. It's not like we need it really. So it could be nice if you change port to one that doesn't have PS2, you can cover the hole up again.
So here is my old uh, Sound Blaster 16. It's a CT2819. I really like this one. It's very easy to use. Nothing fancy, but uh, yeah, it's fully populated. I want to recap it at some point. I'm collecting caps to do a nice recap. But for now, it will be untouched. Mm, pair there to isolate this gas card to so make sure it doesn't short out. Let's check here now. Can we get to all the headers? So, I might have to take the USB thing out when we install the floppy cable it's kind of tight here but uh, all the cards are in and uh, serial and USB is hooked up so let's connect the ATX cable here this board runs off 80 or ATX and uh, the power switch on the front is already set uh, it's one of those um, intended for ATX was came like that when I got the case also. What are you gonna do when it doesn't fit? So I think everything is in now. Uh, we have to check to make sure header connect connectors are in the right polarity so the LEDs work later. But for now they're at least in the right spot. I'm not sure about the whole hard drive LED for the SCSI card. It doesn't have any pin out mentioning or anything and there's no ground pin that I can find so it's completely controlled by the card. So I just have to figure that out when I try the system later. I'm pretty sure I've used it before, so it's not that, I just can't remember. So the next thing would be to actually mount some ha a hard drive in an optical unit. So I'm mounting the optical unit here first. The hard drive is going to go on top. It's the plan. Uh, it's a bit hard to film this. But yeah, and you can see the power supply has the grill facing upwards, obviously, before the time of uh, well, somewhat modern power supplies with the uh, 120 or bigger fans, uh, so yeah, they didn't take that into account because why? How could they? So that's what it is. But basically, here we have a big opening here and down there. Doesn't look as big under here because of the perspective, but it's big enough. So the the, the air coming to the front will come up here and go out the power supply. Plenty of room up here too. So that should work. Is it perfect? Nope. But this should work more than well enough for a machine of this low power output. We're basically using a mobile CPU, so very low output. And this is the SCSI drive. Should fit right in here. Might put it on top or so I'm just hooking up power to everything now. And then we're gonna do cables. And we're gonna put it some night here somewhere. All these cables uh, once I'm done. So, so we're gonna get this uh, SCSI cable in with the terminator at the end. And uh, the noise is this plastic foil they use over the cables. And, uh, a very special pattern as it supposed to has to do with uh, avoiding data corruption, maybe. It's like network cables and stuff. Okay, that makes a bit of a noise, these cables. If they're typically straight up flat, like your ID cable, I usually intend for like 10 to 40 megabytes per second. So it's like ultra wide scuss. So, yeah. So, this would go. These connectors can be quite sensitive to which they are covered for them, but I never got any with my, my cables. Um, 
So that will go there. Now we need this atrocious cable for the for the uh, optical unit, but I'm just gonna pull it in for testing now. I'm really not that interested in using it. Just interested to see if everything works. Then we're gonna do a new cable that is rounded and shaped to fit this case. Yeah, you can already see how annoying this cable is. Unwieldy. If we can get some better light. They didn't even use an angle connector. Would have been nice of them. But they didn't. So it's not gonna look like that when we're done. That's the plan to remove this. But for testing. So I'm gonna connect the other ends and then I'm gonna test it. Make sure everything is hooked up correctly so we can move on with uh, finalizing the build. I tested the system, it boots up. Uh, there were a couple of uh, front head pan connectors. The SCSI was the wrong way. Power LED was wrong, but otherwise uh, it works. And I had to swap the Sunon sleeved uh, fan for a slightly lower RPM Sunon maglev. It's all maglev now because uh, this one was drawing a little bit too much power. Apparently, so it triggered some uh, overcurrent protection on the fan header. But uh, this slightly lower RPM one is working fine. So you can see my problem here though. I really hate this. So I bought some 50 wire flat cable and a few of these, so we only need two. Then we got the, the uh, sleeving, the wire one. So I think we should be able to make a sleeved cable that can go from here, obviously, up here. A little, a little bit nicer to the optical unit, that's the plan. So, I have added a connector on the end here. So, as a starting point. I use a vise to get it in place, but it's a tool, it costs about 20 euros that uh, you can clamp them on with. But by hand is, uh, well, forget it. At least, I'm not uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, so I can't do that. But yeah, so, I could actually have bought this like with a sleeve, but it was probably intended for walls and stuff, so probably pretty stiff. Not sleeve like we would think, more like a soft pipe. It was quite expensive too. Yeah. So I think this is the better way. It's gonna look better, be easier to use. So now I need to actually get some sleeve on here. Um, though even if I didn't buy that uh, other one. Could. They had an image of how it was like made and it was rolled up like a set or something like this. So it was kind of my plan. I don't know if it's gonna work, but uh, obviously done with machine. But here, yeah. maybe I have to tape it together or something a little bit. I don't know. It's not gonna go as far down as one might like at the end here, but. Still gonna be better, look better, be easy to use. So let's see. The Captain tape will hold it here. that stop it from fraying. The problem is to get it on when it is like that isn't easy apparently. Maybe I need some more tape. Kind of helps getting it on. again and let's remove this
Now I want some shrink wrap. These were one to three, so basically the diameter becomes one third of what it is now. Once it's shrunk, it shows that, so I have more flexibility and fits better with the, how much this can change shape diameter. So the idea is to get that on there. I'm gonna put some glue here. Don't want too much, it's gonna come out flowing otherwise. So now we can hot air it on. So, not much left. Um, Hope it's not too short. I took some extra, but that's because it's gonna get a little bit shorter when you open it up from my experience. Mother Nature and her rules. So, Let's see if I can uh, do something about this. Yeah, don't burn. Tape it down here so I don't have to deal with it right now. And then open it up again. And I have to go out in the garage and basically put the other connector on. I want to verify with an original one that I'm doing it the right way. So let's see here. That's the beginning and that's the end. And it doesn't really matter what way you come in, uh, which way the cable comes in, as long as the connector is the same orientation with the, uh, with the notch and uh, the red stripe is on the right, same side. So I need to figure out where that goes. So I'm gonna go and uh, put it in, in the vise so we can continue. But this will go like so and that will go over here, like so. So it's on. So I'm gonna cut off the excess here. Just gonna turn off my. No, I need my hot air station. <laughs> so then we bend this over here. Let's put this thing on. And that's the connector side of things. Now I probably need to shorten this sleeving a bit. And some hot there. So let's see, I think we'll start up here at the uh, optical unit, see if we can get it out from there. It's in, so then it should go like this. 
should be perfect, more or less. So, I think that's much better. Not perfect, but uh, much, much better. So, probably time to reinstall the OS and uh, do some benchmarking and stuff. So, we are up and running. So, I did some measurements on the VRM. Then we installed better heatsink on. So, on my open test, test bench, like I mentioned, without a fan, I was at about 72.4C on the heatsinks. With the new heatsinks, it was about 62.8, so about that 10 degree drop. And I have measured now, this is all on the Prime 9 to 5, so I measured now with the 80mm in the front here. Quite, I think it's like 2000-2600 rpm on that one. We're eight, we are about uh, 49 centigrade now on the heatsink, so... A very good improvement over stock, I would say. You can obviously see my custom cable here, and I tested it with uh, the text, uh, the optical unit, and it works, so that's nice. Uh, yeah, so the, considering it's 80, I think the cable management now is pretty good. The USB is a bit ugly. Yeah, but it, it's the problem with 80 baby, so. And all the drivers are installed, so we're running Windows 98 right now. I'm gonna do some screen capture and uh, show some tweaks I'm gonna do to get more out of it. So here we are in uh, Windows finally. So we can take a look at TPUC here, see what we're dealing with. So we got our AMD K62 Plus, uh, 672 megahertz, 120 megahertz. Bus. got the L1 caches, the data cache and instruction cache, 32, 32k each, 128k of L2 and uh, 512 kilobytes of L3 on the motherboard. So yeah. And we got the VP3, that's the same as MVP3. Uh, yeah, we're running one XAGP memory, 112 megahertz. 128 megabytes, we're running 2225 time eggs. Uh, we have uh, like a GeForce 2 obviously. So that's our CPU. So we can run Quake 3 here, tweaked a little bit. Quake 3 fast. Let's see. And then 34 frames. Let's run it one more time just to see if we can get a little bit more. 134.9, so almost 135. Install a program to enable memory interleaving. Some boards have that in the BIOS, but this one does not. You see here, uh, where did I put it? So I installed DirectX 7, uh, NVIDIA 7.76 drivers, and uh, VIA 4 in 1. Uh, 4.26 so we're gonna use memory enabler set up 9x yes so this will ins will basically enable uh, memory interleaving four way so back in windows here again so I just connected my monitor up again to shake because when uh, we run this program, we install it now, it will auto start and you will see it, uh, see it before Windows starts, just after uh, BIOS post and everything. So it's enabled now, so we can try our Create 3 fast here again. Uh, 
And then 35.8, so it's not that big of an improvement here, but it's like one frame. But it was a free frame, so. I think in memory benchmark, I, see, I think I see like 10% uh, more memory bandwidth or something like that. So I'm gonna use another program now, uh, two actually. So I put them downloads, programs, uh, VP credit. So there's uh, some zip files here, PCR files they're called. Uh, that's, they are zipped now, but basically what the PCR file is, it's like a lookup table. So like for uh, like you registers in your chipset, so in this case the MVP uh, tree. So first, if you want to have this to auto start, if you make any changes, you need to install this program first called VP credit set 12. Then we can run this program to configure it. But uh, what I actually have to do first is actually figure out some tweaks. So this is basically a, like a BIOS configurator replacement. If your BIOS doesn't allow you to set some things, you can do it from here. Not everything will work. You can try to change cast timings for memory, but that will usually lock the system up. I have never seen that work. But we can go to uh, 70, I think, yeah, 70 here. You can turn things off, so like 7. The first bit is 7 because it got 8 bits and they start at 0. So I got 7 bit here, 6, 5, 4, and so on. So 1 is on. And uh, yeah, there can, can be multiple bits for one thing. So I don't know if you can find that here. Uh, I think this could be multiple bits. It's explained here, but this, this is basically like what you would see in your BIOS, maybe a bit more, uh, well, more well explained and also a bit more cryptic since you might not have all of them. But you can toggle something on and off. So you can set that to a one, for example, and it will turn blue if you want to have it, if you took push set. And if it, the system doesn't like it, it will hang. But I already figured out some things on this system. So I'm gonna go to 70 here. Um, 70 here. So it's like 70, 71, 72, 73. You see 80. So I'm going to position 70. And you can also select the hex value here and flip the bits. So I'm gonna do, go D5. And set and yes. Now we can see the blue things are on or off, depends. Off can be a one too, so it depends. So, like one here says off. So, depending on, so you can try out different things and try to find more performance on the system. So, I'm gonna go to 73. And this will not work on your motherboard unless the same board. Uh, so, we're gonna flip this to uh, zero one, would be that one. Yeah, so PCI master one right state. 0 equals no wait state, 1 equals 1 wait state. So apparently I set that. Uh, we're gonna turn that off, I think. Well, not off, but to 1. And now we can exit here. And we can go back to Quake 3. We should gain even more performance, hopefully. So rate on six. And to nine point two. Now if we want the, uh, these settings to be applied during a uh, boot up, I need to use the other program I showed. We have to set one point two. I know already installed that and need to install that first. And then we can run this. You can now I push add, and uh, can I, as far as I know, you can ignore these three here. I haven't had use of them. Seems to be like you can specify a device, but uh, even number zero seems to be the chipset. So we can go 70. Let's see. 70 is the register, and uh, that's the same thing as the offset in other program. And I want uh, D5 for hex. 
data is the hex value. So push OK on that, and then we add another one for that tweak. So number 73, and we want 01 in hex. Oh well, I forgot to put it on startup, obviously. Let's see, sys of Sandra, we could check out the SCSI drives performance here. Close that. And that's on the drive benchmark. So let's check the score of it read 89, sequential read 75, and that's about the fast the drive can go. And to get it up there, some of those with credit tweaks will help with that, and also setting. Uh, uh, Write, write back cache on the actual SCSI card of BIOS will help with the, with the sequential write performance. I have had a bit higher there before, but yeah, it varies a bit from run to run. But you can see here we're beating out 2x7200 uh, RPM ID drives, 8100 in RAID. And we got 4 millisecond access time. I would expect at least 9 millisecond, millisecond on a normal 7200. But the, like up to 12 is common. So yeah, pretty fast. And it's noticeable when you play like, I played Counter-Strike on this when it was on the breadboard box, uh, uh, the pizza box, and yeah, it loads fast in games. And go to 3D Mark 2000 and see what kind of score we can get. A new custom benchmark change. I'm just gonna turn off benchmarks that has no impact on the score. Only these first three I use was for measuring the performance and uh, for the score. These are or extra feature tests, I think. And we're gonna change here to, to two runs. To, uh, tends to give a better score. And then benchmark. We got a 3D mark score of uh, 4028, so something I did on the previous hard drive was apparently faster than this. Don't know what I'm missing, but yeah, it's still over 4000, so that's pretty good. So here we can see CPU, and it's Prime 95 stable for 24 hours, so that's pretty good too. And for people who don't like uh, Quake 3 looking like garbage, we can run one that looks more like uh, Quake, Quake 3 is supposed to look like. The other one was 640 by 480, low texture quality. This one is 1024 by 768, uh, full, uh, full texture quality and uh, all play models on and so on. Twenty-four point three. So suck at this. Apparently, and I'm playing through the capture view here, so it's I'm behind half a second or so, maybe more. Being a super sub seven system, they performs pretty good. Okay, my friend by the recap his board and Aladdin 5. That board is like 15% faster, and this is like 
two to six percent faster. It's like twenty percent faster. So his record right now at six hundred sixty megahertz, I think, is one eighty some FPS. The tighter the red flash. So around four FPS more than me. So yeah, I can definitely be even. But a twenty percent faster uh, Super Soldier Seven is definitely doable. His telemark score is almost five thousand two hundred. Like well over 25% higher than mine. And this board I have is not considered bad, like MVP3 is considered pretty good. But they are even faster. So the ships as a motherboard is really important for a good Super Soccer 7 experience. Here. So yeah, as you can see this is very playable. Gonna have to Tinker more with this myself later, but now everything is working and it's fast and stable. So there you have it. This is the completed system. So here in the front we got the, the optical SCSI CD room. Got the yellowed K62. It's like a pin for your shirt actually, but uh, we made it into a sticker. So it's like metal backplate stuff. Well, energy star. And my old uh, floppy from 96, from a pencil 166. So yeah, this case was like a barn find, so it was really bad shape. But I restored it. Put some new paint on it too, in some places. So yeah, and the whole supply is basically brand new. So here we can see the PS2 port I added to the motherboard. I got SCSI here externally if we want. So yeah. This is the completed system. And also, well, too bad we couldn't have a 3DFS card in it. But yeah, I got these from Sacrificer on our Discord. I some really nice uh, 3DFS stickers. So I think I'm gonna put one on my primary LAN computer here. So, uh, might be a little bit dark here. You can see here, we got uh, Microsoft Binbows uh, to defix. Don't remember where this comes from. Atlon sticker, then we got uh, to defix stick here from Victor Bart, I think, from uh, LAN in 2019. So, I figure we add another sticker here because this thing has with a 2 SLI, 12 megabytes. So. Let's see, add this one here, I think. You cannot have too many stickers. So yeah. And we have Mac there too. And the Alpha. And the Compact. So yeah, thank you for watching and have a nice day. If you want to follow us, you can go to our social media webpage braindrainlan.tk and pick your favorite platform. Link is in the description. You can join us on our Discord server. We host public LANs when possible and game nights on our server hosting many old classical multiplayer games like Quake, Counter Strike and much more. Or you can show off your own retro LAN or maybe visit our members private LAN parties. We have a galleries, benchmark channels where you can post images, videos of your retro hardware and your scores and much more. So come and join us and share your retro experience with us. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.